Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth installment of our Trade-Centric University Masterclass Series, Driving Growth and Adoption Through E-Procurement. Today, our hosts are Kevin Kazemeyer, Head of Channel Development at Trade-Centric, and Ben Minot, Customer Success Manager here at Trade-Centric. In this session, you will learn how to build the groundwork for successful partnerships with customers, effectively launch and market new integrations, seamlessly transition end users with the training and tutorials, and last, continue nurturing accounts post go live. But first, I'd like to turn your attention to the sixth installment of our trade-centric masterclass series, integrating B2B connective commerce into your omni-channel strategy. Additional details will be released shortly. As a reminder, you will be on mute for the duration of this masterclass webinar. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function and we'll address them at the end. And now I'd like to turn it over to our hosts, Kevin and Ben. Hey, thanks, Melissa. Thanks everyone for joining our latest customer exclusive masterclass series. Um, I'm joined today by Ben Minogue from the Trade Center Customer Success Team. And uh, Ben, I'd like to welcome you and thanks for joining me. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Kevin, for having me and hello to everybody else. So I'm Ben Minogue. I'm a Customer Success Manager here at Trade Centric, and I've been here for just coming up to a year, actually, which is pretty exciting. So my role is to work with our customers and help them with their integration needs from punch out all the way through to purchase orders and invoicing integrations. And part of my role is also ensuring that our customers are getting the most value out of the solutions that they have with us. And this includes helping them with the adoption part of the process, which I know is what we're going to cover in a lot more detail today. Prior to Trade Centric, I was in the EDI space for a few years, again, helping customers to integrate and automate these processes. So yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Thanks again. And I'm looking forward to today's discussion. So let's uh, let's get to it. So if you join our previous webinars, um, you know, they've been mostly focused around the e-procurement uh, cycle. You know, successful organizations, they follow a path to e-procurement growth. And that cycle is broken down into five steps that really help organizations like you do what they need to do to grow and achieve e-procurement growth. So over the course of the webinar series, we dove deeper into each of the first four areas. Today, we're gonna focus on that final phase, which is the adopt phase. So the adopt phase is really focused mainly around how to maximize the most from your connection that you just completed with your customer's procurement system. It includes things like launching effective launch plans and building the right materials to help drive growth. Now, in order to be successful with the adopt phase, we need to lay the proper groundwork. So there are two key ingredients when mixing together the right effort and content will really put you on the proper growth path. So be proactive and drive adoption. Now those are they're essential to be successful. So let's do a quick refresh on how to be a proactive advocate. So as we discussed in our spring series, when focusing on enable and engage, uh, there are some key steps that you need to follow to be proactive in supporting your new e-procurement integration capabilities. Some of the following tips that we reviewed previously and others are new and essential to really help you drive adoption post go live. To be proactive, it, it really means to cast as wide as a net as possible with both prospects and customers, and to let them know that you have the capabilities to support punch out and e-procurement integrations. Being able to leverage multiple channels in your organization to help with the targeting communication will also help fill your pipeline. This is really though, it's not the last step, right? The last step you wanna be able to start identifying your targets, engage readiness, and confirm their intent and willingness to move forward with the integration. It's basically, it's not like the movie. If you build it, they will come. You have a lot more to do than just building a field and hoping that they will come. So Ben, when you think about 
confirming willingness and targeting, what other things do we need to consider here? Yeah, of course. So there's a, there's a few things that you definitely need to be aware of. Firstly, what I'd say is that when you're targeting your customers, try and do it in bulk rather than one at a time. And the reason I say this is because each customer you approach might have a different process that holds something up. It could be that they have a tender process they need to go through before they get onboarded with Punch Out, or it could be there's a, a contract review process, or it could just be that there's lots and lots of things they have to tick off first. And all of this, you know, it can take up to six months in some cases. So if you are only focusing on one customer at a time, you could spend months on that one customer before moving on to the next one. And there's also a chance that these customers might decide to not go ahead. And again, you then spend all of your time speaking to that one customer before starting the same process with, with a new customer. I'd say that that's probably one of the biggest missteps we see. So I'd really, really focus on a, on a bulk approach rather than an individual approach. And our customers tend to see more success this way as well. And we see them onboarding customers a lot quicker this way also. Awesome. So it's really, I mean, it's really about just knowing your targets. And, and you know, when you think about speaking about knowing your targets, um, you may be aware that one of the value adds that Trade Centric offers is, is around uh, doing the research and helping you identify potential targets that may already be part of our network. Our trading partner analysis provides you with all the details that you need to help engage early, as well as set a roadmap on how you would want to connect and grow in the future. So Ben, you run these types of analysis with your customers. We partner together, my team and your team, and you've had customers in different stages of their life cycle at Trade Centric. So how has this analysis worked for you and your customers? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I've worked with a lot of customers to complete this trading partner analysis with the help of your team. So thank you to your team as well. And customers really like it because it gives them that insight into their customers, which a lot of them haven't ever had before. So the way it works is our customers will have a list of buyers that in an ideal world they can connect with. This could be for punch out or for other message types, such as purchase orders and invoicing. And this list will generally be their top customers. So top 20, top 50, top 100, however many they want to connect to based on the criteria that they've set. And that criteria is usually set on things like how much money that customer spends with them or how many purchase orders they send through on a, on a monthly basis or an annual basis. So they'll then supply us with this list. Once we receive it, we will cross check it on our end to see who we've connected with from that, from that list. If we have connected with them, how many times? And then we'll mark down which procurement system they use and what solutions they've got integrated with us as well. And this insight is really, really useful because it allows our customers to see which of these buyers of theirs are the easier targets. They know if we've connected with someone previously, then that buying organization definitely uses Punch Out as an example and will likely want to connect that way. And by providing them with the procurement system as well, it helps the customer when targeting these buyers to personalize their messages and their approach to, to try and get them onboarded, which I know is something we're going to, to cover off shortly. Something worth mentioning at this point as well is that the expectation on the customer once they receive the list is to create an action plan and not just sit on this information thinking it's done. So we do get some customers thinking once they get the list, that's it. The work's now on trade centric. However, it is on the customer to then follow up with their customers have those conversations and make sure they are able to connect and that they are a match. So, so it raised awareness to the potential that's out there, right? But your customer actually had to do the legwork to recruit and, and get them into the integration pipeline. Yeah, definitely. And that, that's the process. So, so we identify them, but it is then definitely up to the customer to speak to them, make sure they're a match and then get them integrated. So the work is on them at that point. Okay, cool. So that's that's a lot of information, right? And, and, and really what to do and how to gather it all. But can you share an example of like one of your customers and the success they had with this type of analysis? Yeah, of course I can. Yeah, so a very recent example we've had is where a customer who signed up with TradeCentric, they originally had a target to bring on five of their customers to get them onboarded with the punch out solution. And through completing the trading partner analysis, it gave them that insight to then target these five customers and it resulted in them onboarding all of them, which was which was brilliant. That's what we wanted. That's what the customer wanted. So it was a real success. 
They've since brought on another 11 customers of theirs and just brought on the 11th customer by using this data to help them target the customers with their outreach. And this is just one example of many, but we you know, do this on a monthly basis and customers see a lot of value in this, this uh, process. That's a great example. And if I think back to our last session that, that Tom Roberts hosted um, about ROI, I think that analysis really helps factor into how you can grow your opportunities and drive more ROI out of your initial connection. Because now, you know, as you said, originally they're looking at five, now all of a sudden they have 11. That's some nice growth opportunities. And I'm sure, again, what we've seen with our ROI is that there's also additional revenue opportunities of expanding those customers based on their current sales. So a uh, great example. Thank you for that. So once you've completed your first connection, um, you want to be sure you let your customers know that you have the capabilities to support their needs. And I can't underscore it enough how much email blasts to all customers are important here. And basically leveraging email blasts to a broad group to raise awareness and then a specific targeted group. But you wanna be sure to keep your initial email simple and not too technical because you're just kind of shouting from the rooftops, hey, look what we can do now. I can show up in your procurement system. And you want to include educational information and call to actions that really that encourage your customer to engage you for any additional follow-up information or questions. Once you do that, you then want to then look at targeted and personalized emails to a specific group. Now, these targets can include platforms now that you're able to support or other verticals that you might be in, like government or universities. Um, and you can even also find a ways to personalize even further by looking at procurement pages on some of your public customers. It contains valuable details to understand the, the systems and the processes that people in that space are actually leveraging when it comes to e-procurement. And the call to actions on these specific emails, they should all be about trying to schedule a meeting to begin the process. So again, coming back to you, Ben, I know... We've worked together as well on some emails and, and working on templatizing approaches for your customers. Um, can you walk us through a little bit about um, what you've been doing and, and how you've done them with, with regards to emails? Yeah, of course I can. Yeah, so after I've done a trading partner analysis with my customers, it then generally leads to a, an email campaign because they now have the insight into their, into their buyers and the customers. So a recent example I have is a customer had made a target list of 50 buyers and their criteria was based on customers that spend over $60,000 a year with them. To target the customers, they were going to send a generalized email to them all, which covered their capabilities. And in this case, it was punch out, purchase orders and invoicing. And then in the email, they said they could implement these solutions with whatever procurement system. I went on to name a few different procurement systems such as Ariba, Cooper, Jagger. So it was a very generalized email covering everything to everyone. So we work with them to make the email more targeted because we believe they'd have more success in doing it that way. So we told them to include the name of the customer they were targeting. In this case, it was universities. We told them to include the name of the procurement system they used because we had this information. We knew which procurement systems the university used, uh, uses. Uh, and the way it was worded was along the lines of, we would like to implement these solutions with you through the Ariba platform, or Cooper platform. So it called out the specific procurement system. For the higher priority targets, we also told them it would be worth including the amount of spend or the number of orders with them that could be streamlined because this showed them how much time and process they could be automating. Um, in terms of who they were sending the emails to and the more generalized approach, it was anyone who had a procurement title Whereas in the more targeted approach, they identified who the best contact would be from researching and also from speaking to the contacts at the universities as well and asking them who the best the best contact would be to send these emails to. So it sounds like when you worked on the hitting these 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 targets with personalized contact um, content, it showed that you had something of value to provide to them and actually drove better or higher response rates. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And the success in this case was was great as well. So just to give you an idea of the results they saw, they were were doing it in phases. And after the first targets that they send the email to, they had five customers get back to them quickly to say they definitely wanted to connect. They did have a few get back and say they were interested, but wanted to focus on other priorities for the time being. But it's something they'd like to do in the new year. So it helped them build up that pipeline and plan for those those customers to onboard. And then there were a few that did say they didn't want to set up a connection because they didn't spend enough money with them to invest in that connection. And these were customers who were on the lower end of that priority when we completed that trading partner analysis. So again, something worth noting here is that it doesn't guarantee a 100% response or success, but it is a chance to really open up and start having those conversations. And also just to understand whether these customers are a match for you and for them. I know in this example as well, I've just been through, the customer sales team do plan on following up with calls to see if they can get them onboarded. And having the sales team familiar with the offering and having these conversations, it's really, really important. And again, I know that's something we're going to touch on shortly. Yeah, so it sounds like it also, it offers that ability to really identify your pipeline or or get a, a pinpoint accuracy on your pipeline, right? Because now... I know who those hand raisers are and who I want to go connect. And I know that I can connect first and quickly. And I know ones that maybe I have to work a little bit on or I can plan them out. And then the last ones, even those ones that aren't a, an opportunity yet, they still are someone that you're aware of that could be on your radar and you still could approach them in the future. Maybe you have some extended value-added services that you can offer them. And now having a, a procurement solution may allow you to gain more business with them. So um, those are great approaches and appreciate you sharing with uh, with us, Ben. So let's look at the last step in the proactive phase. And this is really also a refresher from our earlier webinar. And that's all around enabling your sales team. So sales reps, they, they need to be comfortable selling and talking about your, your offering. And some of our customers have had great success by equipping their sales teams with questions to ask to help identify an opportunity or by simply even building a list of buzzwords for the team to be aware of when they hear it at their customer to know how to react, how to use them and understand them in a conversation, and then how to properly hand them off to a team who can then take that conversation even deeper. So it's always important when you're working with your sales team to also have marketing content to support them and have the proper leave behinds about your capabilities. So these are great ways to start the conversation just about your basic integration ability and what you can do to support them. So what we've done is we've created a template as a guideline for our customers who are, are looking for initial content to begin proactive communications to your customers. And so again, this was really driven by a lot of our customers' requests and our customer success team. So Ben, why don't you talk a little bit about how your team has been able to use this type of material with their customers and the feedback that you've received so far? Yeah, no problem. So that the marketing content, it, it's really useful for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's, it's useful internally because it helps the sales team and the internal teams understand what they have to offer and the capabilities. And this is really important because the sales teams or the account managers they're the ones who, in most cases, speak to the customers most often. So it's important they have those materials to back them up. And secondly, it's a great tool to send out to the end customer you're targeting. So they're fully aware also of what you've got to offer. Offer, sorry. And as you can see on the screen here, here's an example of, of some of the marketing we've, we've put together. We have lots of customers sharing this with their buyers. And we also have customers creating their own marketing materials, using this as a starting point or including it in the pitch decks. And in some cases, we've even had customers create their own videos, talking their buyers through the, through the punch-out process or the solutions that they've got integrated. Um, if you are wanting to push a capability out to your buyers, having marketing materials is a great way of doing that. And we often get customers you know, feeding that back to us as well. Yeah, so I've actually used something similar like this in my past, um, You know, being on, a, a, on the distributor side. And I noticed that just having call outs to the specific platforms that are key to your industry 
that even helps spark the initial interest or it, you know, shines a light bulb on in that buyer's head of, hey, wait, they're talking about Yardi. I actually have Yardi. Or they're talking about Koopa. I have So that's another key a feature is to to call out those platforms that are key in the industries that you're targeting. Yeah, definitely agree with that as well. So now that you have all the content and and what you need in in this first phase, it's time to turn our attention now to what are the ways that we need to drive adoption. And you know, the most important thing in driving adoption is the launch plan. So as projects complete and customers complete their go live, it's important to create a launch plan that is multifaceted and touches on a lot of different areas that would help communicate to the users within, within your customer base. The key here is building a base offering that also helps provide your customers with pick and choose options that they can look at upon launch and determine what may work best in their organization. So your launch plan, it can even be more than what we're showing here on the screen, but these are kind of the basics that really should be covered in all situations when you're walking through a launch with a new customer on e-procurement. So we'll start off by looking at the welcome email. And as we talked about earlier with the a neat email announcing your capabilities, a welcome email is another most commonly overlooked task when it comes to launching your new punch out e procurement integration. What happens is many, many companies, many people think that because punch out is generic and it's hard to gather user email information and that's customer sensitive info, that, you know, we can't gather that information. So I don't even think about it. But, you know, Ben, this is where partnering with your customer is really key. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. And when you have a plan that includes welcome emails, you can offer your customer the option to provide you the user emails or send it on your behalf. And in many cases, your customers are willing to share because of the awareness it will generate to the program that they're trying to continue to build. What I'd say is that when you're crafting your welcome emails, be specific about who you are, how to get to your catalog and some of the benefits that you as a supplier can offer to the user. If possible, even offer a link or attach your training materials if you do have training materials. And this also doesn't have to be the last email you send. You know, check with your procurement team about the frequency of communicating this with your end users. Just because it's called a welcome email doesn't only have to be you know sent at the start. You might want to send this a few times a year or once a year just to always get your capabilities in front of the your customers and the end users. Yeah, so so you mentioned training materials, right? And that these training materials should be attached to the email. Well, it actually shouldn't be the only time that you you'll need or or want to leverage this type of content. Right? So the adoption and growth of your punch out, it really is going to depend upon how easy you make it for that end user. Now, what we're showing here is just a one-page tip sheet that contains details on how to access the main features of your site. But you know best what your key capabilities are. So you're going to want to make sure that you include examples on not only those key features, but just simple things like how to find your uh, catalog on their platform. So if you look over in that first example, the first picture, it's actually a picture of the B2B store on someone's Koopa environment. And it's easy to get this type of information if you just ask, right? So sometimes you can go to your customer and you can tell them that I'm going to conduct a training session or I'm looking to build training materials. I want to know how do they find my catalog? So what you're going to do is you're just going to have them walk you through that path. What are the clicks? What are the steps? Or maybe they'll even allow you to join a Zoom session to see it for yourself and, and, and take screenshots. But you know, these types of training materials, they're multi-purpose as, as well because they're also there to help educate your internal staff so that they know and are aware are all the features and functionalities of your site. So when they talk directly to end users, when they're handling support calls, they know exactly where they're starting and what they're experiencing and how to address their, their challenges. 
So the training materials, they can help you also build an effective training demo. And I know, Ben, you've had a lot of experience around building successful demos. So how does training materials help build that demo? Yeah, so so demos that they really are a great way of walking your customers through that process and showing them how easy it is to use. You know, it ultimately helps you to build the customer's confidence up in, in using Punch Out. And there may be specific areas within Punch Out that you want to call out, such as specific features. And it's also a good opportunity to focus on the areas you know, where users tend to struggle. So if there is a part of the process that does need calling out, like clicking on a certain icon in the procurement system to access punch out, this is a, a really, really good opportunity to, to showcase that. And also there may be questions the customer has, which you can cover off in the demo. And it could be questions that keep coming up. So it's a really good place to, to cover that off and, and get the customer confident in, in using the system. We do often advise the, the customer to record these demos so they can, their customers can always access it without having to arrange further sessions. They've just got a link to the demo and can go in and you know review it as and when they need to. Yeah, so it's great, right, to be able to to pull that detail together. And now, if we think about it, you know, we want to be able to 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 take that information and push it out to all the users. And we circle back to how do I do that? Well, I do that by partnering with procurement. And so in most organizations, the procurement group controls the process for their e-procurement platform and all newly onboarded suppliers. And even some procurement groups and finance teams, they're, they're accountable for the growth of the platform and the ROI. So it's important for them to get as many users utilizing new ca uh, catalogs and, and bringing on as much spend under management as possible. So really procurement, they can teach you the tips and tricks to success within their organization and they can also be your best advocate. So basically procurement is kind of the first person that you should work with to get contacts and they can really help you with those welcome emails. So. What you're probably not aware of, and, and this is something, again, by partnering with procurement, by talking and asking the right questions, is that procurement can also help with placing your information on their platform or an internet site. Typically, they have some kind of centralized location where they're publishing announcements or talking about the latest enhancements, and they're show, showcasing new suppliers. Understand that, get on that list, know how to communicate out to those users. Many of these platforms, they also have a supplier information page and they have some place where they're doing regular announcements or newsletters. Again, ask the questions when you begin the integration of how they're communicating internally and how you can participate. Now, something else to also take note of here is that sometimes with punch out, and preferred supplier status, you may also even be able to get further along in your support by offering other value adds. And that's where we talk about when you're building this comprehensive plan, you know, now that people are getting back to an office or maybe even in a hybrid situation, look for opportunities to be included in on-site vendor shows or lunch and learns to really get access to as many end users as possible. And if you look at like the information we're sharing here is these are examples of like sample content that you can use when communicating out, hey, we've arrived, we're now part of your procurement platform, or hey, we're gonna be on site, come visit us on this day. Or as Ben mentioned earlier, we've recorded some videos and we recorded some sessions. Here's our recorded sessions. Here's our training guide. Here's who your account manager is. These are key pieces of information to, to, to stay on top of because the more communicate users you can communicate to, the better your adoption is going to be and the better you're going to bring all that spend under your management. So we talk about communication and we've talked about all these great plans, but the last thing that you need to be able to do is really track and measure your growth and adoption success. Now, Ben, I know this is an area that is sometimes underutilized and, and, and our role is 
not always utilized to its fullest, but it can be pretty powerful. And, and I can vouch for that because I did use it when I was a customer. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about the business intelligent portal and how we can leverage that for growth and adoption and, and tracking uh, capabilities. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I completely agree. It's definitely a, an underutilized tool and a lot of customers aren't aware of it. And that's probably why it is underutilized. But once they are aware, they really like it and they do see the value in it as well. So within our business intelligence portal, our customers can have access to a report suite, which allows you to run reports on how your customers are using the solutions that they have integrated. And it's all exportable into the CSV as well. For example, you can run reports specific to punch out or specific to purchase orders or invoicing, whatever solutions you've, you've got integrated. If we take the uh, punch out solution as an example, it will show you on a monthly basis how often your customers are punching out and returning cards. And this information, it's really useful because it allows you to see a few different things. Firstly, are your customers actually punching out? And if they're not, you can then take this data to that customer and ask the question, you know, why aren't you punching out? Is there a reason for that? You know, we've set this up. Why is it not, you know, going through to a, to a punch out session? Secondly, are they punching out regularly but not returning carts? It allows you to see that and get that data. Again, you can then take that to your customer and ask them the question, why is that? Why are they punching out and not returning carts? Is there an issue or is it something else that you need to discuss? And then thirdly, not only is it a great way to track your customers, they get on board with the punch out, but it's also useful to, to run these reports regularly because it allows you to see whether there's a drop in punch out sessions if, as an example, every month for a year, your customer is returning on average 100 carts, just say, but one month, you only return 10 as an example, and the following month, you know, it dipped to 10 still, you can take this data to your customer and have those informed conversations with actual data to back those conversations up. So it's a really, really great tool to give you that insight on how your customers are behaving and gives you that data, like I said, to have those informed conversations. A lot of customers really do like this tool once they're aware of it and they use it regularly as part of the reviews that they then have with their, their customers. Yeah, so Portal, I can't stress how important Portal is. And, you know, again, going back to my previous experience as a customer, uh, Portal reporting, I, I kind of use Portal to the max and it's really only gotten better in the last few years. And it's going to continue to get better because the the analytics phase of it is is just beginning, right? And 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 what are those quick, easy tools that we want to put at your fingertips? But for me, tracking of who is punching out and understanding where their challenges were were key because I was able to understand, hey, does this user need more help in training because they seem to punch out ten times in the last week and they never returned a card. So maybe they were confusing or maybe they just didn't understand how to get to cart and check out, or maybe they need some additional training assistance. Um, so that was really important and helped us drive more adoption. And the other piece was to see new users that were punching out to us. And really we were able to track these locations we've never seen before, but now that we've offered punch out to this entire company, we were getting locations that never purchased before start to buy from us. So we now actually knew where to put an account executive at a location or someone from our sales team to reach out and call those users to find out maybe they needed more from us as well. So that also helped with the growth. So portal, huge. And if you, if you haven't um, played with it enough, definitely reach out to Ben and Ben's counterparts that, that are your contacts because it's something that you you can really leverage and harness the power of it for, for growth and adoption. So that's actually um, all we have to share from the adoption side. Um, I'm gonna transition to a little question and answers. And before we get to that, if you have questions, as Melissa mentioned at the top, please chat your question in the Q&A section in the chat. Uh, Melissa, I'll turn it over to you to see if we have questions. Yes, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Ben. Um, ben, this question came in for you. Uh, we sometimes run into roadblocks trying to get our customer integrated because it's not the right contact. 
What are some of the right people to contact? Or do you know ways to find the right contacts to reach out to? Yeah, great, great question. Um, what I would say is look for specific personas that are typically central to any integration. So usually someone tied to the procurement system lead and someone who's responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the system or the supplier relationships or even onboarding as well. And these can be different titles such as you know, buyer, category manager, technical integration systems lead. Uh, you've got the procurement systems analyst, project team lead, ERP analyst, um, director of procurement, or purchasing. So they're just some I can think of off the, the top of my head right now. But, you know, always feel free to reach out to, the, to your CSM, myself or one of my team, and we can we can help you with that. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, and to build on that, what are some indicators that a customer would be a good target for us as we sometimes run into roadblocks, even if we find our customer is on Ariba? Yeah, of course. So what I'd say again is you have to find the right mix of volume, such as purchase orders and revenue, and also volume as well. Just because they're on a, a Reba in this example, you know, it doesn't make them want to connect with you. You have to demonstrate the value to them of, of why you're also a good fit. You know, in the example that I ran through earlier, I mentioned how a couple of customers said they weren't interested in connecting with them through punch out. And that was because they didn't spend enough money with them to invest or didn't send enough purchase orders. So the value has to be there for both you and your customer, you know, in order for it to be a match and for the connection to take place really. Great, thank you. Uh, Kevin, question came in for you. Um, it's how can I convince my other internal teams like marketing that this initiative should get resources dedicated to promoting? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say it, a lot of it is all about how important this initiative is to your company. So again, as I alluded to earlier, we had the ROI webinar last month and we talk about how much e-procurement can drive growth and revenue and, and focus on new channels. So if you see e-procurement capabilities as a growth driver and also an underutilized channel for new revenue in your company, you really need to pitch to these teams about that value. And if you need assistance with um, that ROI piece, you could definitely work with either you know, CSMs like Ben or with my team because we help run strategy sessions to kind of identify that and shine a light on it to help you um, make those presentations higher up in your organizations to get those resources that you need. Great, thank you. Um, Kevin, can you talk more about how to gain information about e-procurement from public entities? Okay. Yeah. So it's probably, this is from earlier when um, we talked about how to, how to identify um, your targets. So really, if, if you go out and you start Googling, simply, simple Google procurement and the customer name, especially if it's a, a public entity, you're going to find procurement pages for these types of companies. Universities come to mind as, as a big area where if you Google university name and procurement, you're not only going to find the names of everybody in procurement, but you're going to find policies and procedures and details about the platform. Like I can tell you that when I was a supplier, I was shocked at how many times my company name showed up in public entities and was talking about my capabilities because again, serving servicing a public entity, they had to share that information. So you're able to find details like key things like what's the name of their procurement platform? Do they call it something? Is there a code name like Mountaineer Mart or Hokie Mart? And you'll find that some of these places have unique names and some of them just call it iBuy. But if you're able to talk to those terms and you're able to research that, that helps make things more personalized as well. Great. Thank you. Um, ben, do you have any resources to help during outreach? Yeah, so we, we've got the sales sheet, which we showed earlier in the marketing slide, but we do have a lot more than that as well. For example, one of the things that we can do is, is something with Kevin's team, actually, where we conduct a strategy workshop where we dig deeper into your specific situation and then we help you come up with a, with a strategy to then target your customers and hopefully get them onboarded. We do have other tools to share. Again, that probably a bit more specific. And if you reach out to your CSM, such as myself or one of the team members, whoever your CSM is, um, we can help with that as well. Great. Thank you, Ben. 
Um, I'm going to turn it back over to you now, Ben, um, to give our viewers the tip of the month. Yeah, of course, no problem. Perfect, just paint the back. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for that. So the, so the tip of the month this month, it's all around our trade-centric university training. So we mentioned earlier about creating demos for your customers, and we've also kept true to that as well, and have done the same thing for our customers within that business intelligence portal. So we've been creating videos to talk our customers through how to use this portal and access the different features in there. And this can be accessed by clicking on the question mark once you're logged in, as you can see here in that screenshot. But again, ask your, your CSM if you need the help on that. So far, there's, there's four videos in there. So I just thought it's a, a really good opportunity to call them out. Uh, the videos are, the first video is the business intelligence portal search and filters. And this video talks you through how to access the search and filter functionality and how to gain the ability to navigate and locate key, uh, key information within, within portal as well. There is a working with reports video, and this shows you how to run those reports that we spoke about earlier and access that data so you can have those informed conversations with your customers. We've got the punch out emulator video, which shows you how to recreate a punch out session as if you were a buyer punching out to your web store. And this allows you to see you know, what that buy is seeing. And also it's, it's generally used for testing and basic troubleshooting, I would say. You then have the transaction log video, and this shows you how to gain valuable technical visibility into your transactional payload across the different integrations that you've got, such as punch out, POs and invoices. So they're the, the four videos we've got at the moment. It is worth mentioning, we are in the process of creating more videos and one coming soon is how to convert a punch out session into a purchase order. Uh, and so far, we've really been focused on internal customer videos. But as part of our trade centric university, we do plan on creating more customer focused videos next, next year, which hopefully you can then share with your customers as well. So do stay tuned. There is more to come uh, and always be speaking to your CSM if you do want more information. That's what we're here for, uh, here to help. Great, thanks so much, Ben, for that. Um, and thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Ben, and thank you, everybody, for joining. As a reminder, please be on the lookout for details regarding our next Trade-Centric University Masterclass series. It will be about the topic of integrating B2B connective commerce into your omni-channel strategy. Um, and with that, we are closing the webinar. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and thank you again for joining.